Hello, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to our first music forum of 2021. I'm Robert Taub, Director of Music at the Arts Institute, University of Plymouth. And as many of you know, we're in lockdown, and uh, therefore this is a truly live streaming event. I'm in my home, and so is our guest this evening, the distinguished conductor, Mark Fortune. So um, we will, as usual, invite questions from you, our audience, um, to uh, please send them in via email and we will happily address them um, after we've had a chance to talk with Mark. It's an absolute pleasure to um, have invited Mark for this music forum. Mark is, as I mentioned before, a distinguished conductor and this music forum is focused on the art of conducting. Now, many of us have seen, and some, some of us may have played in orchestras with um, you know, 100 people led by an illustrious conductor. What does a conductor do? How the, does the conductor's thoughts and expertise influence the performance? These are some of the questions that we will address this evening. And so without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome Mark directly to us. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Your, um, your, your role in, as a leader of conductors and, and the critical musicianship that you bring to you know, our, our lives is, is very valuable to us and we appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. It's a delight to be here as well. Thank you. So why don't we just dive in? As I said before, you know, many of us have seen or worked with conductors. Um, and one of the things that stands out in conducting is that often, most of the time, the conductor uses a baton. Maybe you could tell everyone um, what, 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 what is the baton for, demonstrate the use of the baton for the spectrum of conducting. Tell us a little bit about what the conductor is actually doing with the baton when he's, he or she is standing in front of 110 musicians. Um, really, it's a means of communication um, and of clarity. Um, and when we start to study conducting, obviously you're, you're given a stick and, and, and taught how to use it. And there are various schools of thought. So obviously you, you start with, with learning your beat patterns. Obviously the four is easy, three is easy, five is easy. Um, you get onto six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and you need to know where you're going. So that would be a six. A seven could be grouped in numerous different ways, a three, two, three, a two, two, three, a three, two, two. A three, two, two would be, and there. So you have to have those patterns in the same way that a pianist or a violinist learns their scales, you have to be able to do these. It, it, they, they are just part of your technical makeup. Um, you have the stick really for clarity because if, especially if you're without a stick and many conductors don't use a stick, normally with very, very good groups who don't need that clarity for ensemble. Um, if you think of you at the back of the cellos or the basses at the back of the first violins or up, up in the percussion, that just gives that extra layer of clarity, especially side on, that you don't get if you're doing that, um, which is why you people more often, if you notice conductors, when they, some conductors, if they have a stick and then they dispense with it, it's in a delicate moment in a slow movement or something like that. It's not in a bit where the whole orchestra needs to be with you. So um, you're holding the baton in your right hand. And yes, you know that that's typical. So, um, you know, pianist uses both hands, all instrumentalists mm -hmm. use both hands. And by the way, later on in our conversation this evening, we'll, we'll have some musical examples as well that you've kindly prepared for us, Mark. So yeah. um, could you just describe a little bit how conductors use, you know, the, the relationship between the two hands and what each is for? Yeah, you can, and it's your whole body, really. I, I think that we can get hung up that there's a lot of school of thought that says, oh yeah, do you beat with one hand and you show the dynamics in the other. And you, that you end up a little bit like a puppet if, if, if that's the case, but you're, you're using your whole body. Um, so you can, I mean, if you, you don't want to just stay, say the same thing twice, because that, that's pointless and people stop looking. Um, but you can, if I show you what you can do with one hand to start with, you can beat with just your fingers. If you're holding the stick in a certain way, you change that to your hand, you're saying something a bit more. You change that to just the forearm and you're saying a bit more. You go for the whole arm and you say, I'm off the screen. 
Um, but they are saying very different things. Equally, if you want to do that to an orchestra, you are saying something that's very different from that. So as a, as a conductor, um, yes, in a most simplistic sense, you're beating time. You're, you're, you're capturing that critical musical as, um, uh, criterion of, of the pacing of the music mm -hmm. by beating time. But you're actually doing far more than that because every gesture you make is an expressive one. Absolutely. Everything you do with your body, with your face, is, is, part, is, is communicating something to the players of what you're doing with the music. Um, conduct, yeah, there's it's a good friend of mine who I've made music with quite a lot. He always talks about if you have a long rehearsal process or something with a, a young orchestra, he said, he said he knows, he knows when we're doing really well because I can start conducting rather than beating time. <laughs> And, and I think that's a, a great distinction that you are. And, and once you get to a certain stage, you don't think about what you're doing. I think if you did think about what you were doing, you would become too self-conscious. You're just thinking about what you want in the music and finding a means of getting that back. So how then do you, you indicated quite vividly um, when you were just using the different swaths of baton movement, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you indicated quite vividly how you can enlarge certain types of expressive gestures. What about other, other things? How, what other ways do you have to indicate dynamics or phrasing or you know, other expressive gestures? I mean, um, you know, we, we can do that when we're speaking, we do that with emotional content of a phrase you know, without even thinking about it. But how, how do you do it when you're conducting? You, I mean, the, the size of the beats will do it a lot of the time. The obviously just, being more relaxed, going, it's almost like if you're riding a horse, if you just sit back, yeah. people will sit back with it. If you charge in that, that will create a, a, different, a different feeling. Um, that is a very dangerous one. You do all do that occasionally, but that just, it, it immediately makes people feel uneasy. There's, there's that, or just gently makes people feel comfortable with playing quietly, because we all know it's much harder to play quietly than it is playing loudly, so you need that reassurance. Um, the the other thing the other thing you can do is that there's this great misnomer that being clear with a beat makes people know where it is. Actually, that's not true. It's the flow between that gives people a tempo, not the clicking. Um, so you could that 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 you actually have no idea what tempo I'm in. That you do because it's the flow between, and there's no points to the beat there, it's just the flow, but you sort of know where you are. If you want to really get soup and if you're doing some Brahms, you just go sideways. <laughs> and, and you know you do that and a string section will use the whole bow and they will do it. Um, so it, it's, it, there's almost an onomatopoeic um, instinctual relationship that you are creating you as, as Mark Fortune, the conductor, and other conductors may have slightly different ways of interpreting or showing their, their, their musical thoughts, expressive nature, gestures, what they want the, the instrumentalists mm -hmm. to communicate, simply yeah. by the way you move your hands. Yeah, yeah. And also, I was very lucky, and I studied with a number of people, and they were very good at, um, they're very schools of conducting. Some are quite dogmatic, that they say you, you will hold a stick like that and conduct like that. Um, that's cutting off a lot if you're up there all the time because you want to be there, it's something different. But I was always taught by people who said, let you develop your own way of doing it because being an individual is what it's about. Yeah. Um, but they just said, oh, that doesn't quite work, try that. So they, 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 were, they were like those buffers you see at the bowling alley when you're not very good at bowling um, and, and rather than just, just pigeonholing you. And I think that's really important because being an individual musician and having some say is why you're in the middle. Otherwise, you shouldn't be there. Right. So, as a you know, as a touring soloist, I've mm -hmm. had experience playing with uh, many different conductors and, and many different wonderful orchestras, and it's incumbent upon me or any soloist to understand as quickly and thoroughly as possible the way a particular conductor works and communicates. Um, part of that understanding is knowing exactly where the beat is at any mm -hmm. time. With you, it's very clear, and, <laughs> and, that, and that's great. Um, and uh, what you were doing uh, when you were demonstrating ways of beating time was uh, you were, the, the beat, it seemed to me, was at 
you know, toward the end of your stroke, whatever that stroke mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. is. Is that reasonably yeah. accurate? Yeah, I think so, because that's the point where you're moving. Right. You're almost in figures of eights rather than dots. Right. If you, you think but, of it as a figure of eight, then you... But because of the, the smoothness of your motion in between, it's very, cl it's very clear and very comforting to know where the beat will fall. Hmm. And, this, this, um, and we talked about this a little bit when we were thinking about some of what we might cover today. Um, the, what I'm about to s say comes under the heading of musicians reacting in different ways to the beats and, and based on the physics of producing sound of their instruments. You know, if you play a, a note on the piano, depending on, you know, if it's in the middle register, the quality of the sound is pretty immediate. Mm -hmm. um, wind instruments might take a little bit longer, right? Mm -hmm. So um, how do you, as a conductor, make sure that the ensemble actually is playing together? Um, you have to encourage people to listen for that and develop with an ensemble where they're going to play. Um, there are some people in ensembles who think they're being really good by ensemble by play, almost beating you to the beat and playing right on top of it. Actually, no, it, it's finding that happy medium of people listening to and knowing where they're going to be. And sometimes if you, if you do that, then some people might try and play on top of it. So that the more you try and micromanage that, actually the less successful you are. because if you let the players listen and know where they're going to be. And sometimes you have to say, actually, Woodwind, you've got to get on top of that a bit more, or strings just, you have to, or as you have to wait, if the strings are just seeping in to meet a woodwind chord, they've got to wait. But generally you, you've got to trust people to be musicians as well. Um, you cannot play every note for them. Right, and so you would trust um, the uh, double basses, for example, who have very long strings and therefore it takes a little bit longer to set into motion those long strings with their bows, you would trust them to know when to come in so that they are, first of all, together as a, as a group and secondly, together with the rest of the ensemble. Absolutely, yeah. So Otherwise I you'd be conducting in a different place for the, the violins, the double basses, <laughs> the, the, the oboes and the flutes, and the double read, double reeds against a, a, sing, a single reed as well, it's very, very different. So a number of years ago, I was, I was um, playing with, I, I had some, con I did play, played some concerts with the Philadelphia Orchestra and then the, conduct the guest conductor for that invited me to play with his own orchestra, which was up in Montreal um, in Canada. And so we decided to collaborate on the Bartok Third Piano Concerto. The second movement of the Bartok Third Piano Concerto is extremely atmospheric. It's, you know, Bartok night music outdoors, you know, but it ends um, in a very beautiful, um, subdued, introspective manner with the piano playing a very low E minor chord and the double basses playing pizzicato, low E. The conductor, and I learned this a little bit in Philadelphia and more in, in Montreal, doesn't, did, at the time, didn't beat um, in the, the way that you are um, beating and that the end of the stroke is the, the time of, of, of the beat. Rather, everything was up. So yeah. um, instead of coming down, one would be like this and two would be sort of like that. And it was kind of, you know, you get used to it. And it, um, as a soloist, you're not really in a position to say, maestro, could you please make your beat a little bit more clear? <laughs> um, and you know you don't want to. Down well, it? So, so in the in the rehearsals and particularly the dress rehearsal, um, I needed to find out for myself. I needed to feel comfortable when I was going to play that low E chord, and because it was with the double basses, his he his back was toward me, and his arm, his right arm was way over here. You know, if I try to stay in the picture, I can't, but he's way over toward the bases so they could see his baton going, going up. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see his baton at all. But what I noticed in rehearsals was that when his arm went up, the seam of his jacket also went up <laughs> so, on his shoulder. So I looked for the seam of his jacket to go up and in the dress rehearsal, as the seam of his jacket went up, I played this at, at the point that I anticipated it being, you know, the highest without the jacket ripping. And um, the bases were, we were all together. So you can't, you know, you can't always rely on seeing the stick 
there are other tricks of the trade. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. There, all, there always are, and, and everyone and different orchestras will play at different points and different gestures that may have worked with one orchestra will not work with another. So yeah. you have, so you're always listening to see what works with a specific group. So um, it's always a challenge. Uh, there must be incredible challenges also, interesting ones, I hope, mm -hmm. in conducting different types of ensembles, choral, orchestral, chamber ensembles, and I know that you do all of this. Could you tell us a little bit how you, share with everyone how you prepare and what your thought processes are? To um, I, I'm, I'm a little, a bit of a maverick in that case, in that I try to conduct all of them in the same way, but I'm definitely not the norm in that in that fashion. Um, you're preparing the music in the same in the same way as you do for them. The difference with with a lot of choirs, especially unaccompanied choral music, um, is that they all have all of the music in front of them, and they don't they don't need the, the beats and where you are within a bar to be clear because they all have that. So you will find that choral conductors tend to do everything around here. They don't tend to go out there where you need players will need to know. Oh yeah, we're in that part of the bar though. There we are, and it's, they're generally uh, more compact as a group. So, for instance, with with a choir, if you were starting a piece that had a a crotchet rest and then three crotchets, you would just simply do the, and they would know whether. If you did that with an orchestra, they probably wouldn't come in. They would they would need the rest, the downbeat, and then they play. And and that's that's a, a big difference. And you can do the, the sort of things with the choir that way, and it will work, and that flow is there. But that wouldn't be enough for an orchestra, who of course they only have their own part. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, so I, I think that we have a a musical example that you've prepared that begins to illustrate some of this. Yeah, we do. It's going back a long way, and someone who was one of the great choir trainers when when I was growing up was George Guest at St John's. And he built St. John's in various guises over years and years of being there. And you will see from, from the wonderful sound he gets, this, this warm, glowing sound from the choir. But you see what he's doing. He's, 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 he's just encouraging them to come along with the music, not really beating time in any shape or form. Okay, let's go to that musical illustration. That's a great example, and it's very, very clear, very beautiful singing and, and music making as well. So thank you for sharing that, Mark. That's cool. So um, we talked a little bit about the relationship of the beat with instruments. What, what about with voices? Um, with voices, it's, it's quite uh, different. You have to, um, a lot of choirs are trained to go right on the beat, right on the beat, right on it. And sometimes you have to give them the confidence to just ease into a beat in the way an orchestra is if you want that sort of sound but 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 singers depending on the size of group will generally try to sing right on the beat with you because a lot of the time well most of the time they'll be singing words and to get consonants together and to have that level of clarity that you need you you really need most of the time to sing right on the beat uh, because if you're coming in with a word that starts with T, you can't sneak in as the string section would, even if it's pianissimo and you would want that because you'll just get spluttering. So needs must on that occasion. So it does generally lead to quiet being bang on the beat. Uh, sometimes it's quite nice to get them to just have that little bit of extra freedom. Sure. And, and with, with, with respect to differences in conducting different ensembles, I think you also prepared 
um, a couple of additional examples for us, um, part of the Dvorak Ninth Symphony. Um, and that's with uh, a youth orchestra, is it not? Yeah, a student orchestra, yeah. Fantastic. Um, maybe we could go to that example as well. Yeah. So Mark, um, that was Marin Alsop, of course, wonderful conductor. How, how would you characterize the way she approached leading these young musicians? Um, it's, it's quite interesting because I've, I've known Marin a number of years because because I was I was because of her Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra connections as well, and and she is very very clear, very technically it, it's a crystal clear. And it's interesting seeing her with the student orchestra where she's actually probably conducting more than she would have to feel she would have to with a professional orchestra that she'd know well. This is a student orchestra, she probably hasn't spent that much time with them. So she is showing everything, even going into that, into, into, into that climactic point, really laying down where she is four beats in a bar to get them there. Um, and so a lot of it is like taking a dog for a walk. Um, there are moments when you can let it run, but when you get to the, the important moments near the road, you have to tighten the leash. And that's exactly what she was doing then. She was to end into that. No, this is what the tempo is going to be when we hit that G major moment um, to make it clear. Uh, and so there was there was an element of, of real control there with everything that was going on. Yeah, that, that's that's really interesting. So we've heard you um, uh, describe uh, metaphor, bring in metaphors with respect to horseback riding as now dog walking. <laughs> how, how would you describe the next example, which is uh, a Haydn symphony led by Leonard Bernstein and I think the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, what, what, how, how would you metaphorically describe Leonard Bernstein? Um, he's just letting them run free and enjoying the ride with them and inspiring them. If, if we're taking that metaphor for that, he's, he's like the jockey that just enjoys the ride with the horse and inspires them to go faster. He's, he's just setting the character and not getting in the way and making music happen. That's great. Let's go to it. Let's hear it. absolutely wonderful as well and of course we saw quite a range of if you think about it quite a range of of ways of leading being the director of yeah you know the, the, these fantastic musicians ranging from almost not conducting at all and smiling at them you know they're old friends after all uh, from you know just a simple facial gesture a facial expression 
and a quick gesture of the hand to you know invoke excitement and, and change the mood instantly. Yes, and coming from the, coming from minimal movement, a, a tiny movement can have a dramatic effect. Um, it's it's not trying to show everything; it's just saving it for when you really want it to register. Um, there's if uh, anyone wants to um, uh, get like, on YouTube, it's Haydn eighty eight. They then perform the on the from the last movement as an encore again after that, and he doesn't conduct with his body at all. He just does it all with eyebrows and looking. It's it's extraordinary to watch. Well, he he um, had wonderful relationships with many orchestras who, you know, mutual adoration societies with 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 quite a number of different orchestras, and and he had a, a knack of communicating um, the excitement, the drama you know, introversion, extroversion of, of the music, not only to the musicians, but also through his gestures and the way he led the musicians to the audiences as well. Mm. So, um, it, you know, it's... What, yes, for, for him, it was, a, it was a communal feeling invol involving the audience very much as part of it as well. Um, they always say there's a danger. There's some conductors who conduct for the people in front of them and some who conduct for the people behind them. Um, that he, he, he involved everyone rather than too much show voting for people behind him. Yeah. Well, let's go back for a moment um, to the question of, because it's an important one, the, the relationship to the beat for different instruments and voice. Um, mm. You had prepared also a, a wonderful example of Mendelssohn Midsummer Night's Dream Overture. Mm -hmm. um, and tell us a little bit about this. Walk us through this before we see it. Um, it this is Kurt Mazur, right? Um, yeah. Also with Oh, with his orchestra, Gewandhaus Orchestra in Leipzig. Absolutely, oh. yeah. Um, but I, I, I was really glad I found this because I remember going to see them do this at the Barbican uh, when I was fairly young with exactly the same forces they came and did it in London and this very piece. And I was interested in conducting at that point and I was really scared by the opening because it really felt like the conductor and the orchestra were in a different time zone with the relationship between the beat coming down, yet this chord coming out of the woodwind section absolutely together. But I, it resonated with me. I found it deeply unnerving that you would do that and you felt, it felt that you had no control over what was going on, but it was just the, it's just the way they play. Should we listen to it? Yep. All right. I think we have some ligeti. Okay, let's um, let's let's stop that for a moment. We we got slightly out of sync here. Um, I'm sorry. Um, we're actually listening to. Um, we'll, we'll rewind this example a tiny bit. Um, this is the fourth of the examples. Um, we're listening, to, we'll go back to Mendelssohn in a little while. Let, we'll start this example that we started um, once again in just a moment. This is um, an example, this highlights uh, complex music, um, new music in a, in a certain sense. This is uh, Ligeti. Um, tell us a little bit about this, Mark. It's, it's really when, you, when you're conducting a small-ish ensemble, um, most most of the time, if it's an ensemble of that size needs a conductor, it means the music is going to be complex. Um, because if it weren't, they'd, they'd happily make music without you. Um, and in in situations like that, it means that it's it's difficult for the players. They don't necessarily know what's going on all the time. And you are there to, to really provide the means for them to play at their best. And that means ultimate clarity. Um, so that they feel confident, so they can look up and know exactly where they are within a bar. Any extraneous movement can put them off. Um, so, and you'll see this is Nick Cott with Zaffa, the the the, the music group from from Manchester. Um, it, it it looks very functional, but it's exactly what the players need to make the music work. 
and and they need everyone needs to feel um, reassured as well because in some cases this may be the first time that musicians are playing a particular work as opposed to you know the 88th time that they're playing the Beethoven Ninth Symphony for example Absolutely. of course Absolutely. there's always a first um, <laughs> in many cases with new new music today it really is the first so yeah. you yeah. need um, reassurance you need guidance you need a different kind of leadership from the conductor you do yeah all right, so let's, if you don't mind, um, let, let's go, let's hear this example again um, in its, in its um, entirety. It's not a very long example. Uh, Ligeti, and this is a chamber orchestra, uh, a chamber orchestra work. That was a, a very clear example, um, Mark, of um, the type of leadership that you were describing, um, which the beat is very clear. Uh, the musicians are dependent upon that. They need to play their own parts, you know, play their own roles very, very well, and also mesh with other members of the ensemble. So yeah. there are a number of challenges. Um, it was interesting to see the different seating arrangement, completely different from, you know, anything we've seen this evening so yeah, far. Yeah, yeah. And in, in, in a lot of, well, 20th century and then contemporary works, um, especially ensemble works, the you will have a completely different seating layout for each piece. As you well know, in many, many composers specify that seating arrangement. Others don't, but many composers do. Um, so with a contemporary music group like Akura, we ended sometimes with the concert, we end up with everyone swapping chairs all the time for where they are. The biggest worry is that they have the right music in front of them, but 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 it's very much to suit each piece, that lineup, which which can be confusing, but it means that you you get into the sound world of each piece. Right. Because that's part of the composer's intention. Right. That's very true. And you know, speaking of seating arrangements, um, let me, let's talk just a tiny bit before we get back to the Mendelssohn, which we were headed toward. Um, let's talk a little bit about the seating arrangement within traditional orchestras as well. I mean, it's not always the case that the first and second, first violins are, you know, to the conductor's left and the sec on the outside and the second violins are slightly in from that and then violas and cellos on the conductor's right. Um, do you have a, I, I know that certain conductors have preferences of, of rearranging that a little bit. Um, what, what, are you, what are your thoughts? Um, they're governed by uh, a mix and match a bit, I have to be honest, depending on two things. Uh, the repertoire, yeah. because of course, different at different points, if you're playing Elgar, you should really have the first and the seconds. You should have the seconds, if you like, where the cellos would, would traditionally be, because that's, that's how it's designed as music and that the antiphonal writing for the first and second violins is a very important part of the music. Um, in some venues, depending on how well people can hear, if you have the cellos in the middle, the bass line running straight through the middle of the orchestra really helps everyone hear and helps ensemble. Um, so for instance, some, some, some venues will work better with, with a, a slightly different seating out. And I'm, I'm quite pragmatic on that. If, if, if it works for the music and it means it's a, a easier to play in a certain venue, we'll change seating. Right. Okay, well, that, that makes perfect sense. Uh, yeah. Why not? Yeah. Uh, let's um, go to the example that um, you had uh, prepared for, once again, the relationship to the beat. Um, uh, 
and that is the Midsummer Night's Dream uh, Overture, the excerpt led by Kurt Mazur and the Gewandhaus Orchestra. So if we could just hear that, and then we'll talk about that a little bit before moving on to another topic. It's so hard to um, hear only a short excerpt of, of such wonderful music. Um, but with, even within that short excerpt, you know, we, we can talk about a few obvious things. First of all, he didn't use a baton. He didn't use a right. stick, right? And that, that, that's the way he, he worked. He, um, I don't think I ever saw him uh, with a no. stick. No, he was So, too. you know, the intricacies of using the hands in, in different ways of manipulating uh, the, the I wanted to use the word manipulating the sound, but he's manipulating the interpretation of the sound, really. Mm, yeah, you, I mean, you have, I mean, the stick is brilliant for clarity, but sometimes if you want to show even more of what you want, your hands can say more than a stick sometimes. And, and, and he's a prime example of that, um, that you can really say a little bit more with your hands and what they do than you can with just this, this one stick. Um, a devotees of a baton would say, "Well, you've got the, the baton in one hand; you still have your other hand." But, <laughs> but, but, but then he was—he's just showing what he wants to happen with the music with his whole body as well. And that, that of course, was his orchestra. I mean, you know, they—they they, yeah. they, were—they worked together all the time. So the slightest um, inference, the slightest gesture, could easily communicate a world of difference. So, absolutely, yeah. So let's let's talk about that topic a little bit of you know touring conductors and some conductors have their own orchestra, some conductors are guests only, some are both. Um, it must, you know, it, 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 what, for, for a pianist to always be confronted with a, a different instrument in, in every concert hall, you know, it's a, a bit of a challenge. You try to look upon it as um, a positive situation where you find the best qualities of the instrument and capitalize upon them. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a little different dealing with an inanimate object from dealing with a group of musicians. What, what, what are your thoughts about dealing with different ensembles and different orchestras and then also working, with, I know you work with Corcoro a lot, so yeah. the, the comfort of working with people that you already know well. The comfort of people you know really well is that you know, you, I know they're playing well, they know my gestures very well, and you can just, sometimes you can, you communicate in a different way if you can, I mean, and a lot number of people in Kokura we've played and made music with each other for for uh, well, twenty five years, mm -hmm. and we you just look at them and they know what you want. You don't even have to say it or even have to show it. You just eye contact will be enough. Um, but then there's that thrill of of of, of guest conducting with a new group if it if it some and it can go well and sometimes it doesn't and sometimes it takes a little while that's life it's the same when you meet people sometimes you hit it off immediately sometimes it takes a while um sometimes you don't hit it off at all that's it and, and, it, and it's no different to that and it can be that sort of white knuckle ride can be really thrilling it's particularly thrilling with a group like um the rpo the royal philharmonic orchestra who um are they're quite they almost seem quite not dozy, but but low key in a rehearsal, and and the first time I was with them, I thought, oh, well, this is a, this isn't going very well. This is going well. And I said, and I had a chat in the break with the lead second. I said, I said, I'm having a right. He said, yeah, we're fine. I said, he said, we're taking it all in. Don't worry. And then you walked out on the night, and it was electrifying. And you just you get used to that's the way they are, and and, and everyone's different. There, there, maybe they were taking. Uh, just assimilating everything that you brought to them and yeah yeah and sizing it and absorbing saving themselves, it and saving themselves. It. <laughs> yeah. when it's ready to go you yeah. go yeah yeah I understand that yeah that's great that's that's very exciting how there's there's another element of excitement how how do you deal with rhythmic complexities 
in in new in new music or in in music generally. I mean, I'm thinking, for example, of the Bartok Concerto for orchestra. Yeah, the two different orchestras on stage, and you're in the middle. What do you do? You you sometimes it's finding the sort of the, finding a route through it that causes the, the fewest problems, um, but also it's it's being very clear for everyone that's there and not doing anything that that gets in the way um, and sometimes you just have to be very i mean you be with a stick you're just being very simple and very clear and allowing them to make music because sometimes if you do that if you try and enjoy what's going on too much actually you you lose that clarity yeah. um and it, it's the same for music um or anything that has irregular meter and fast moving if you're with, with, with the the, the, the seminal Stravinsky pieces, mm -hmm. the less you move and the tighter you keep it, the more people will feel secure in what they're doing. The more you throw yourself around, the more control you lose. Okay. It also means they get they, they need to feel secure. And if you're calm and minimal in movement, they will feel secure that way. Well, speaking of being calm, that makes perfect sense. And speaking of being calm, let's, let's dive into the um, sixth example that you prepared um, <laughs> of uh, the Flater Mouse. I, I'm not sure I've ever seen a calmer conductor uh, yeah. in this particular work. This is uh, Carlos Kleiber. I, I think I might need to say something about this before Please we do, do. Um, um, do, because people will wonder why have I included this and when we're talking about rhythmic complexity. Um, and that is because this sort of repertoire, um, Strauss um, and Actually, a lot of Elgar, where 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 there's it's rubato, poker rubato all the time, um, and actually, so they're tiny little inflections of changes of tempo. They're moving from section to section with changes of tempo and meter, and they have to be done so subtly to work. And if you feel like they're being laid down and really done in a bandmaster fashion, it will kill the music. Mm. It has to be done with the lightness of touch. So it's incredibly difficult in terms of technique of conducting it, where you would think, oh, well, this is easy music, it plays itself. Not at all. And the master, Carlos Kleiber, doing it, he makes it seem so easy and like it's a ballet. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's dive right in.
absolutely wonderful. And yeah. you're right, it's um, very episodic, but the episodes just merge seamlessly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's fantastic. It, it, and, and from a conductor's point of view, it, it, it's really, that's really, really difficult to do. Yeah. I can see that. But you know, Mark, I know that you're up for challenges because oh, yeah. uh, we have another challenge for you. And this is, a, this, is yeah. a, this is a challenge that's coming up in a few months. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, you and I were talking about how you prepare for a new work, and we've discussed that a little bit today with the Ligeti, but we have our own new work that we're preparing for, um, and that will be the um, premiere performances at TRP of Some Call at Home. This has been um, postponed from right before the first lockdown, um, and uh, TRP is putting them on on the 4th and 5th of May. So this, this is a music drama that I've created. It's part of the uh, Mayflower 400 commemorations, and uh, this will be the premiere. And, and you're leading it with the, with your ensemble. So, um, some of the challenges are: first of all, new piece. Second mm -hmm. of all, you know, you've got staging to deal with. We've got a, a guest soprano and a guest baritone, and we've got a, a, a video display, um, a big visual display, um, and all the works that we've listened to tonight, that one usually hears, are composed by one person. This mm -hmm. has two commissioned composers. So we've got a built-in difference or contrast of styles. So how, how is it going for you? Um, yeah, well, it was, it feels a bit weird because we were intensively working at it until, um, until March. And then it's, it's, it's been mothballed since then and we'll, uh, we'll pick it up again. In many ways, that's really nice because a lot of the time when you are doing new pieces, and their, and their commissions, of course, you don't get that much time to learn. And, and you are, um, and some composers are very good at meeting deadlines, others less so. Um, I don't think I should be saying that in front of your students, but that's true. Um, that, and and some, some will, will, you'll get two days before you'll suddenly get the last, the last section and think, oh my goodness, I've got other things to do as well as, well as learn this. But, but having time to, to consider a piece is a, is a real, bonus but you have as a conductor and i've conducted a lot a lot of premieres of conducting music and the relationship you have with the piece it's a real sliding scale sometimes you'll just simply it will in old-fashioned terms now of course it arrives in your uh, on your pc as a pdf it used to just arrive on the doormat and that was it um and you didn't know the composer where some pieces you've been part of the piece's inception and you have a a relationship with that composer and you've talked about the piece from the very beginning before that he's he or she have even put pen to paper or even thought about what the piece is going to be about mm -hmm. um and 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 some composers like showing you sketches others don't like doing that at all and you just have they're, they're different you have to find different ways of working with 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 them on that um and also knowing at, at how the relationship then works with the composer once you get to a rehearsal well, all, all that lies ahead. A lot of excitement. So that'll be good. Um, let's uh, take a moment and step back a tiny bit because, you know, there's always a challenge in preparing a new, a new work, as you've just described. But there's also a challenge in dealing with older music and playing mm -hmm. it today as if it's new. And that really, to me, and, you know, I've discussed this with other friends and colleagues, you know, the, the trick can be summarized as you play old music as if it's new and new music as if it's old. In other words, bring the same sense of conviction to new music that we bring to music that's already withstood tests of time. And by the same token, bring the same sense of discovery and newness to music that has been around for a while um, as if the ink is barely dry on the pages. Make it mm -hmm. fresh. If there are layers yeah. of dusty tradition, strip them off and just get right, and play the music as if it's new and revolutionary today. And no one I think was more revolutionary as a composer than Beethoven. So um, you very thoughtfully have prepared three examples, which we'll hear mm -hmm. consecutively yeah. of the Seventh Symphony, um, the slow movement. Um, just a little section of that. And we hear different interpretations of this piece, each playing it as if you know, it's the only way to play it, but yeah. we have only ways to play it. 
and each with a different conductor, different orchestra, and a different style of conducting. Can you walk Absolutely. us, give us an intro to this? Yeah, I think I might just go back slightly further, is that when you are preparing a, a new book and an old work, in many ways, a lot of what you're doing is the same. You're trying to get inside the composer's head and think what he or she was aiming at with their notation, getting to know as much of the rest of their music as you can, and being true to the score, not and and th those those apply whether it's a new piece or Beethoven five, mm. and 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 if you stick to to those that philosophy, then it it will carry you through. And you've got to even the new you've got to have that. What I love about these three is they have a personality, and each conductor has their own vision of that piece. That's right. There's no right or wrong. It's their vision. You have Reiner to start with this huge long stick this march feeling within the music that you have. Um, then we have a bardo who is silky smooth, um, this beautiful line of, of it and, the le and a left hand that is just extraordinarily um, expressive in what he gets from them. And then we have Christian Thielmann and, and a, more, a slightly more stolid German affair, but incredibly expressive. And, and if you just watch his left hand and his eyes, you know what he wants.
So those are extraordinary contrasts amongst the, the three. Um, mm -hmm. Tempo, quality of sound, of course, styles of conducting. Yeah, yeah. They are, there are three very different visions of, of the music and all equally compelling because they are visions of the music. They're, 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 there's no lack of Beethoven is still there, but their personality is there with it. That's right. And, um, you know, Fritz Reiner, of course, uh, uh, conducted the Chicago Symphony, um, legendary in many ways, uh, and some legendary collaborations, you know, there's, uh, the re recording that he made of, uh, with Heifetz of the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, is, yeah. you know, um, an extraordinary uh, document in a, in a certain sense, but it's a living document. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, these, these figures um, live throughout the, the, the throughout, um, you know, time, regardless of the fact that this was a grainy 1954 broadcast with Fritz Reiner, it's still, it's still compelling. It's still, yeah, it know, doesn't matter in the slightest. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So um, if we think about these different visions of pieces and the different interpretations, we have to ask ourselves the question, what, how did they do it or how do they do it how do we do it and what role does education broadly speaking play in informing our musical decisions i mean each of us has ideas about that i'm curious what your what your thoughts might be i think it's that and and you're bringing your whole life experience into it as well um you one is the obvious context and historical context and uh, knowledge of the time and of the situation and, and of what what the music means beyond the note on the page and and to try and think about that you need to think about so much more than just simply what you're presented with um if you and how you can interpret something i mean you could never you have to have if you're performing something like elgar Gima gerontius you have to have read Newman, you have to have gone through the the and thought about the the whole ideology behind it to know what it means when you get to those moments. Or if you even if you're just performing a William Byrd Mass, you have to to know about the situation to really get within the heart and 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 the sort of kernel of the music rather than just superficially of, of the notes. And I think and that means your interpretations are more than just instinct; that they're, they're backed up with. And you have the confidence to be individual because you are confident in that you know what's really behind the music. And I think I think that's a really important part that that a general grasp of of education gives you. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it's critical to understand. You know, even it, I'll be even everything you're saying makes perfect sense, and I agree a hundred percent. If we take Beethoven, we can take Beethoven, we can take Schoenberg. You know, mm. if we think about Beethoven Ninth Symphony, what an extraordinary act of courage it was to write the Ninth Symphony, a work he had in mind for many, many years. Um, you know, he drafted the Scherzo movement 10 years before the sketches in a sketchbook about that. And he had the idea of taking that sort of mediocre poem of Schiller, Ode to Joy, um, <laughs> and, and creating a masterpiece from it years before that even. Uh, but it, it, in, in the historical context of the uh, Congress of Vienna of 1814, when, you know, there was a reaction against liberalism, such as it was in those days. And um, he wrote in a conversation book, let's not discuss this here, there are spies everywhere. He could have said it, but he didn't, he wrote it down. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore we have it. Um, so the idea of universal brotherhood was really anathema to the people who conducted the Congress of Vienna in 1814. Thinking, going ahead a little bit, a um, hundred years, to Schoenberg and, and Berg and Weber in the second Viennese school, you know, in order to understand their extraordinary creations, we need to know the, the world that gave expressionism a raison d'etre that the, the the history sur surrounding the lead up to world war one the the technology of the time the sociological foundations of the time that led to painters like you know um egon schiele and others in fact even schoenberg is a painter yeah, yeah absolutely yeah and their expressionist gestures as painters as well as musicians yeah and and the literature of the time and the, and and what the social mores were and the context of when when these works would have been performed as well they 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 are they are all 
um, hugely important. And and the world as it as it, it was in, in that stage, especially as those three um, characters, especially Shanta, so conscious of the tradition in which they were brought up as well. Right. Yeah, they, that's right. But conscious of it, but not afraid to go to the advanced state of the art. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. All right. With that, um, let's move to some questions. I think we have time for yeah. a few questions. Uh, let me see if we... I know that we have some. Um, okay. Sophie in Exeter has written, um, what's your favorite bit of advice for conductors in training? Um, try, oh, that's a good one. Um, try to think about what you want to do with the music and have that vision of what you want to do and then how you want it to sound. And then listen to what's coming back from the players or the choir in front of you and adapt your body your body movements to and what you do to get what you want to come back um rather than I, and I, because it's easier thinking about it the other way around thinking oh, I've, I've got to learn this um which is often the way it's taught but i think if your musical vision is clear you will find a way of communicating it yeah that, that sounds good you know one one th one thought that i've had um never having conducted an ensemble but um <laughs> As a pianist, I am always trying to understand and, and listen critically to what I'm doing and to what anyone else is doing, and you know, particularly if I'm playing with an orchestra or chamber music. And so, you know, I remember this, the, the, the Robbie Burns poem paraphrased um, something like this, oh, what a gift it would be to see ourselves as others see us. You know, for musicians, you could say, oh, what a gift it is to hear ourselves mm -hmm as others hear us. So as a pianist, you know, I'm playing here, but I'm taking one of my ears and putting it out in the house, out in the audience, yeah. and listening to any differences that are, that may result between, from various things, whether they're acoustics or things I'm not doing the way I want to be doing on the piano, and, and adjusting, constantly adjusting, um, and listening live. So, you know, there's nothing more critical, that I think, than, than listening and being oh, uh, absolutely and then you know you're thinking and everything that you're doing is geared towards the music rather than yourself exactly exactly okay jeff davis has sent in a question does a baton last a lifetime and is there a variation between between them between different types of batons? yeah yeah there are i mean they don't last a lifetime because they're actually pretty flimsy um and they're very they're pretty cheap they're b b about seven quid or something like that or maybe a ten or something now and it's a while since i bought one because i generally don't tend to destroy them but they you carry them around in a in a case like that so they shouldn't shouldn't break they do break after a while because they're they're flimsy wood and you put a stress on them there and they will go after a while they've i've broken a few in my time they just go that's that's just life um i lost one once in the middle of a concert um it was the end of a movement and i finished it like that and there was this rattling and i thought what size does that come from and the stick the end of the stick was still in my hand the rest had come off it had broken off here and it was on the the on the fingerboard of the lead second violin huh so so they do break um and they come in all shapes and sizes if you when you are allowed to go to the festival hall they had they have a great display of of famous conductors batons and how an atrium bolts hugely long and in order for it to balance lots and lots of rubber bands on the end so that it would balance otherwise it if if you didn't have the rubber bands it would have just tipped over interesting that's really fascinating we have another question um rob uh Rob Innes has asked, does the physical distance between the conductor and those at the back, for example, um, the, the brass or the percussion sections, does that distance make a difference to you as the conductor? Yeah, it does. Um, you have to, it's in, if you think of it in terms of the same way you would work if you were public speaking, if you're speaking to six people in front of you, there's a certain gesture and size of gesture. If you're communicating with, say you're communicating with a large symphony orchestra and a large chorus, your size of gesture and the way that you speak has to, has to mimic that. So you have to be, feel that the people who are a long way away from you are still within your grasp. So you're, you're physically 
being much bigger with everything they need for that. And because they need that confidence, the further, it's much easier playing at the front. Playing a long way away is really hard and they, they need that reassurance from you. And I've seen conductors too and worked with them when they, um, you know, may have one gesture for the brass, you know, and then something slightly different for the violin. Mm. Get out of the way, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get this off of here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or vice versa. Yeah. Yes, normally it's that to the brass and the percussion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I have a question for you, just very yeah. quickly on this, just a tangent. Yeah. The timpanist, often overlooked, but critically important because if the timpanist is too early or too late, you know, that yeah. can be really off-putting, right? Yeah, you can't, you can't fight it. He, he or she will make more noise than you do. Right. Um, and if you're doing something like the, um, the, the final uh, movement of the Rise of Spring, you can kid yourself that you're conducting it, but really the timpanist is. <laughs> because, because if they're not on it, there's nothing you can do about it. Right, okay, good. A couple more questions, um, and then we'll probably have to call it an evening, but let's, mm -hmm. let's do two, uh, two more. Have you ever accidentally let go or dropped your baton in a performance? And that's from John Green. Um, in rehearsals, yes, but not in a performance. So far, touch wood. In rehearsal, yeah, a number of times. Um, as you probably see, because I because I tend to vary the, the hold I have, and sometimes in in I'm often more animated in rehearsals than in in in, in concerts because that's when you're really getting your hands dirty. I'll be trying to, to do and and then you'll drop it, but I haven't dropped it in a show this far thus far. Good. Okay, good. And then the last question is from someone in Plymouth, Philip in Plymouth. Do conductors also play instruments? I hope so. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> I think I think because if you lose sight of what it's like to be an instrumentalist, it's a it's a you 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 get one of the hardest things conducting is is learning to to engage with the music while you're whilst you're divorced from it and you're not making any sound. So I think keeping that physical sensation and knowing what it's like to being a being a practicing musician and playing, I think, is really important. Um, and I certainly want to want to be without doing that. Um, I, th I think, yeah, I think you. And interestingly, I think the the people in front of you, um, they know you're on their side if you do it as well. Sure. And of course, th there are many examples of conductors being really great instrumentals of different sorts. I mean, Leonard Bernstein is a fantastic pianist as well as a great composer. West yeah. think of West Side Story and Candide, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, you know, the list goes on. There's just one more question. It's an, it's an interesting one. Um, last one of the day from Ian Petit. Often when I watch an orchestra perform, the conductor's arms seem to bear no resemblance to what I'm hearing. Is there a secret code or something? Uh, I think it's, it's not so much a secret code. It's uh, establishing a means of communication. Um, and sometimes they conductors will develop with a with a group, and that they may be doing some some kind of weird gesture, but the players will know what they mean because it's been it they've got into their they're on the same wavelength from a rehearsal. Um, I mean, there's some. I mean, I grew up in 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 London um, watching Klaus Tenstedt, mm -hmm. who who in terms of clarity of beat, you do stand a chance, but. His musical intentions were so clear that everyone knew what to go with. Right, and you and I also talked a little bit when we were thinking about um, planning this, we talked a little bit about the great conductor Wilhelm Furtwängler. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, can you, I, I mean, if, if I were to try to illustrate the way he beat time, it would be kind of a horizontal line. It would be something like this. Something like that. And it was yeah. either it was either the, that or puppet on a string sometimes as well. But and they used to joke that you used to play when the baton got to roughly roughly the third button on the waistcoat. <laughs> um, but it, it meant he had this incredibly sonorous sound from the orchestra because he was he was deliberately not. He, he, he was the antithesis of Toscanini in that sense. That's right. And it's very interesting to compare the two in many ways. Yeah. So um, Fort Fangler, was, he was not, maybe he was conducting the way he imagined a sound sculpting in time, oh, yeah. as opposed to specific instances of sound. Yeah, it was all about the line and the, and the shape. Yeah. Good. 
Well, Mark, we could go on, but this has been a fa fantastic evening and a great opportunity to speak with you. So thank well, you. Very, it's very it's, it's a real pleasure. Thank you very much. And, and, and thank you to all, hopefully all of you who've been listening. Yeah. And thank you. Exactly. Let me add my thanks to everyone who has joined us this evening. And um, we'll see you at the next one, which will be the 19th of February. Um, wonderful young artist, oboist Catherine Breyer. Stay well and thank you again. Good night.